In this lecture, we'll look at some of the uh, details of pneumatic structures, and we'll also look at a couple of case studies uh, that really show the difference between uh, air-supported and air-inflated structures, and hint a little bit at when we might use one uh, versus the other. Um, the fundamental principle, as we talked about last time, was uh, pneumatics are basically the inverse of a dead load cable structure, where we are adding overpressure to the atmosphere inside of the pneumatic to make sure that the membrane, the thing that holds the air in place, is always in tension, uh, no matter how much load we put on it. And we calculate this by anticipating the greatest load, whether that's a wind load or a gravity load uh, that would end up being put on the structure, and then calculating the inflation that we would need to make sure that the membrane uh, never went out of tension, that it's always um, in a state of uh, what we call pretension. Um, when we get into the sort of details of this, what we find is that we need to be careful about uh, the pattern of seams and also the size of each individual uh, panel of the membrane uh, to make sure that the local stresses stay within bounds that that um, that'll, that'll keep the structure from ripping uh, or from uh, or from popping. We can do a number of different things with this membrane. We can make them uh, transparent or translucent, which brings in some daylight. Uh, we can make them reflective. Uh, this example here is an early communication satellite that relied on the, the shiny surface to bounce signals from Earth uh, back to receiving stations. Uh, we can make the fabric uh, lined so that we've got a little bit of uh, insulation, uh, but these things are never really great in terms of thermal performance. And finally, um, we can uh, weave cables into the fabric itself so that instead of adding a cable to what's basically a giant balloon, uh, we're being thoughtful about how the, the materials work together. So the tensile fabric and then tensile elements like cables working together uh, and showing up on site in particular in one kind of integrated piece uh, that makes for easier assembly, uh, easier fabrication. Um, the cables are important because, as we talked about, they stabilize the structure, they hold it down, um, but they also take a lot of the local stress that occurs in these structures and sort of collect it. Um, if they are interwoven, uh, they're easier to anchor, they, uh, the, the fabric won't uh, slip past them quite so easily. Um, and when the, the structure is fully inflated, of course, the cables are working exactly like a suspension cable, uh, but now they're upside down. And as we discussed, because the dead load of the fabric and the cable uh, are so trivial compared with the, the pressure from the inflation, uh, the shapes change as well. And instead of the catenary shapes that we're used to seeing in suspension bridges, we actually get things that are closer to, uh, to pure circles. Um, cables, just like in regular cable structures, are usually steel or aluminum. They need to be uh, lightweight and strong, but they also need to uh, be capable of getting joined together easily, not only end-to-end, -end, but also in networks, patterns that give the, the structure stability uh, in more than one uh, direction. Maybe most important are the anchorages at the base of a pneumatic structure. Um, these, of course, are the only things that are keeping the, uh, the pneumatic down. We're used to designing foundations where we're holding things up, but of course, in this case, what we're worried about is the wind actually ripping or leveraging a pneumatic structure out of its uh, bases. So the foundations often need to be sort of screw type foundations where we're uh, engaging it with enough dead weight of soil uh, that it will hold the structure down. But it could be also that we add a, a surcharging weight like sandbags, concrete blocks or something. Uh, to, to actually uh, add the dead weight that will resist the tendency of the wind to both lift it up uh, and, and carry it off. And these, are, these hold down what we call the boundary conditions, the edge conditions uh, that um, have to stabilize the structure both against uh, uplift but also uh, against lateral loads, right, side to side loads. And one of the things that we have to be careful of is that we need to anchor uh, a pneumatic structure regularly around the base to make sure that uh, it holds its shape and we don't have any parts of it that are uh, kind of loose uh, or floppier than, uh, than the majority of it. 
Um, two components that uh, we need to provide that we're not used to maybe with other structures. Uh, one of them is the inflation system. We actually have to add energy to the structure. We have to keep the structure basically plugged in because we need a mechanical system that is going to maintain the overpressure uh, within either the, the balloons or the pillows, depending on whether we're doing uh, an air inflated or an air supported structure. All of these fabrics uh, will have some amount of leakage over time, and we need to be able to resupply the air or to keep the pressure uh, inside of these things at, at, at a constant. So they are energy uh, dependent, and therefore we need blowers that are not just reliable, but that are hooked up to reliable uh, sources of power so that if there's a blackout, we don't actually lose the structural integrity uh, of our pneumatic structure. We um, often only need a, a little bit uh, of overpressure inside of a pneumatic to keep it inflated, to keep it upright. Um, but this overpressure is important. And if we are designing basically a giant balloon where the, the functional space is also the space of the higher pressure air, then we need also a system of airlocks to make sure that when people are entering or leaving the structure, uh, an equal amount of air is coming out as is going in so that we're not uh, taking away the pressure that's actually keeping the, the, the structure inflated. Um, these airlocks can be uh, a bit inconvenient. They're uh, slow to move big crowds through. Um, and there's also a human comfort factor. Uh, our ears will often pop when we go in or out of one of these things and, and people do notice that. And it's something that's a, a mild discomfort, but nevertheless, uh, something that's a bit of a, a, a drawback. So here are some potential uh, anchorages. If we're designing a, a temporary uh, pneumatic structure, we might use uh, what's called ballast. Uh, that could be in the form of water or soil. It could be in the form of uh, concrete blocks where the dead weight of the ballast is actually the only thing resisting uh, both the internal pressure and the uplift potential from wind. If we're designing a more permanent pneumatic structure, uh, we might use screw anchors or auger anchors to literally screw the building down uh, into the soil. And just like in other foundations, we'll uh, look at the, the bearing capacity of the soil. We'll hope for a, a soil that's relatively consistent, relatively heavy, uh, so that an auger or a screw can actually uh, take hold of it. We'll be looking as much at um, the weight of the soil in addition to the composition. So how far down we have to go to add enough weight to the structure uh, that it's going to, again, resist the uplift of, of wind uh, and the inflation pressures uh, within. And here you can see a typical detail where um, there's a, a pipe that forms the, the base around the, the perimeter of the uh, pneumatic. Here, the pneumatic fabric, which is sealed against it and somehow sealed against the ground. And then here, the auger anchor. And again, that's uh, relying on the, the dead weight of the soil to resist the uplift of, of the wind and the inflation. So here is an air-supported structure. This is simply a, a balloon where um, we have a single layer, a single membrane that separates the pressurized space from uh, the exterior. And as you can see here, we are actually occupying the pressurized space. So we need both a blower that will keep an overpressure in here uh, sufficient to resist any uh, wind loads or any gravity loads, snow loads, things like that, uh, that are coming in. And we also need airlocks to make sure that as people move in and out of the space, uh, we are not uh, taking away too much air. We're not taking away too much overpressure. Uh, you can see here the need for um, auger anchors or, uh, or weights to hold the structure down. As we pump air in and as we pressurize this uh, circular section, you can see that the horizontal forces are going in opposite directions. So the horizontal forces are canceling each other out. We won't have a significant uh, amount of thrust necessarily at the base. But we have all of these vertical components that are pushing up and those are the forces that we most need to resist with foundations that are holding the, the, um, the balloon down. These also need to uh, resist the tendency of wind to push the, the uh, pneumatic from side to side or to leverage it out of the ground, right? to pull it out of the ground uh, 
uh, as the wind sort of passes over and creates maybe a negative pressure or a vacuum uh, above it. So here, fairly simple uh, air supported structure, single membrane, uh, basically a giant balloon uh, that we can walk into through, through airlocks of some sort. Um, there are some advantages uh, to these. They uh, do not cost a lot of money. We're mostly paying for a very thin, usually relatively affordable membrane. Um, they uh, do not require a, a whole lot of uh, either energy or monitoring. Uh, there's a single space that we need to, to keep pumped up. And so long as we have uh, enough fans and enough power to keep that going, um, they'll run on their own at a, at a fairly low energy rate uh, without a whole lot of checking in. Um, they're easy to build. We can uh, put them up. We can take them down really easily. This is why pneumatics are so often used for temporary structures. And of course, we've got this huge unobstructed open space. We can easily go uh, up to five, six, seven hundred feet in spans with, with an air-supported structure. Um, of course, we have to make sure that those fans are constantly working, otherwise we will lose our overpressure and therefore lose our structural integrity. Um, we may need a, a secondary or emergency power supply, and any time the uh, pressure is lost or any time the fabric rips, uh, the dome collapses. It collapses slowly, Probably no one's going to get killed by a collapsing uh, balloon, uh, but nevertheless, this obviously is a, a failure and we have to come back and repair the dome, repair anything that gets damaged uh, inside. Air-supported structures are particularly vulnerable to changes in shape when we get asymmetrical loading. So particularly when we get a wind blowing across the section of the dome, um, you see here that we'll get a, a partial collapse here on the windward side and then uh, an inflation both on the top and on the uh, leeward side. So here we've got um, a, a problem with the dome distorting and maybe affecting the way that the space inside works. We can combat that in a couple of ways. We can put uh, flap seals at the base that will actually use a crosswind to help keep the dome inflated and to seal up against uh, when kind of passing through, or we can design the dome to be what's called a shallow rise, where the wind passing uh, or the wind blowing against the dome tends to flow over it uh, instead of to bump into it. And this will basically spread the tension or the uplift out over the, the surface of the dome instead of localized, uh, as you see here. Um, we cannot really insulate with an air supported dome. We have, the membrane has to be relatively thin and therefore um, there's virtually no capacity for thermal insulation. Um, and obviously we're not going to carry a, a heavy load. We can't really use this for multi-story buildings uh, for sure. Um, finally, uh, these things do deteriorate. The membranes being thin are subject to solar uh, degradation. Um, leave them out in the, the weather for long enough and we'll eventually get the fabric deteriorating. Uh, and when that happens, of course, it, it's going to lose strength. So these are generally temporary structures uh, and they're almost entirely used for a single level long span uh, situations. The geometry of these, as long as we're basing it on some sort of spherical geometry, so, the, so long as the cross sections uh, are always circular. There's actually a fair amount of variety uh, in what we can do. So the simplest ones would be uh, just spherical sections, um, but as you can see, we can change the radius of the cross and long axes to make a, a, a more or less an elliptical shape, although um, as you can see, these both have circular cross sections. We can take a, a very, very small piece of a very, very large sphere and again, as long as those two sections are more or less spherical, we'll be okay. And we can come up with more complex shapes. Again, so long as all of the, um, the, the, uh, the ruling lines here are circular sections, um, we'll be able to make whatever shape we want. And the dome will inflate to the proper shape so long as all of those follow this fairly simple uh, circular geometry. If we combine those, we can change the, the radius of the circles um, to achieve some, uh, some wackier shapes, some crazier things. So here, this kind of uh, octopus uh, shape has a local um, curvature that is all uh, spherical. 
but these are combined to create much more complex shapes, right? The spheres radii continue to kind of grow and grow and grow. Um, so long as we break this down into small enough panels uh, and stitch them together in ways that when it's fully inflated, they'll take the right shape, um, we'll be fine. The pressure has to be the same on all of these panels. Uh, and therefore we have to do a little bit of work to balance uh, the tension uh, from one panel to another, especially when we get very sharp corners uh, or sharp changes in the in the curvature. Um, but so long as we're relying on a kind of a palette of circular uh, geometries, we have a fair amount of freedom in what the final shape uh, ends up being. So uh, some one of the more famous um, air supported or balloon structures. Uh, was the United States Pavilion at the Expo 1970, which was held in Osaka. Uh, this was uh, something like a, a 400 by 180 foot, 465 by 180 foot uh, structure. And you can see from the top that it has a very, very big kind of earth berm around it. And what that's doing is it's providing the weight uh, that we can attach or that the designers could attach the roof to, to hold it down. Um, you can see these very, very small circles, right? The scallops across the top. Um, those are indicative of uh, a balloon being inflated and then being restrained or held down by a network of cables. And that's the kind of waffle pattern that you see here. Those are cables that are anchored at either end. And if you squint, you can see that they have a very, very subtle, gentle, circular curvature uh, that reflects the shape of a, of a, of a, of a proper pneumatic. Um, note too that below there is an absolutely massive mechanical equipment room. So this required uh, uh, compressors um, running most of the day and night to keep the space inside uh, at an overpressure, a significant overpressure to keep the keep the roof up. Here in plan you see the ring beam. There's the ring beam there. All of the displays and things happen down here, and then this is the shape of the fabric roof at the top. On the interior, uh, here you can see this is the, the cables are actually uh, aluminum uh, pieces that can take uh, tension as the, as the roof tries to lift them up. You can see locally um, the stitching on the panels, so it's broken down into very, very small elements, and that reduces the amount of stress uh, on each of the seams. And then from the outside, so here's the cable pattern on the roof. Here is the anchorage detail where there's a, a concrete base, uh, a piece here that has the cable anchor. And note that that's designed for tension. So steel cable that goes into those aluminum uh, mullions, concrete compression rings. So the cables are all pulling on this ring, trying to, trying to pull it together. Uh, and then a, a, a tension connection here so that the cable ends up bearing on the ring beam. And you can imagine that, oops, that washer there taking the load of the cable and distributing it to the, the hole of the ring beam. And then these concrete beams are then uh, anchored down into that earth berm uh, to keep the thing from, uh, from basically rising up uh, or off its foundations. And here you can see these are uh, airlock doors. You can't quite see them, but they're uh, revolving doors. And you get a sense here for the, the kind of functional problem, right? A crowd that shows up uh, and has to go in basically one by one to make sure that the overpressure uh, on the interior isn't lost, right? So this is the great drawback of simple inflated structures that act like balloons. We have to keep track of how much air we're letting in and how much air we're, we're bringing out. Air inflated structures uh, are a little bit uh, more complex to build, but uh, they have a very, very obvious functional uh, advantage. So here we are basically building pillows that we can walk under or around. And you, you can see here that we can make these pillows into a variety of shapes. So even though we have circular sections here on each rib, um, each one of these ribs can take a shape that's much more about a, a kind of arch, right, or, or a gravity uh, resisting uh, form. And because we're making pillows, we have to inflate each one of these. But once we've done that, we can walk in and out with no problem. We don't need to worry about overpressure down here in the functional space. 
the uh, overpressure is contained entirely within the structure itself. And here, this is a ribbed one, so we might have cables that run across it. Here, this is uh, what's called a dual wall, where we basically just have uh, a single extruded form uh, that we've inflated. We may break this up on the inside to keep uh, relatively small reservoirs of, of, of overpressure, but these both have the same effect of allowing us to walk into a functional space uh, without the need for, for an airlock. Um, the way these work is that they uh, take the same principle as, uh, as the balloon, um, but they kind of compress it down onto the structure itself. So we are pre-tensioning a membrane by using uh, overpressure or air pressure, increased air pressure. Um, but you can see now that we're basically taking uh, what would be a, a, a beam and instead of letting it go into bending, where we have tension on one side and compression on the other, we're inflating it to the point where no matter what the bending load on, the, on this beam would be, um, the air pressure within is going to put the membrane into so much tension um, that it'll be able to overcome the, the natural compression that occurs uh, in bending. So here, uh, conventional beam compression on the top, tension on the bottom, and you can imagine that when we put a load onto that, if it's a very, very heavy load, we might have uh, the, the top actually try to go into compression uh, and buckle. If we do our job right, though, and we pressurize it adequately, uh, the internal pressure will keep the membrane in so much tension um, that will never, uh, the compression that we put on it from loading will never overcome that. We will talk more about beam behavior in the next course. But for the moment, just know that the, um, the, the kind of pillow structures that we'll look at next uh, are all working by overcoming the natural compression that occurs in a, in a bending structure. So we're pre-tensioning the membrane, but we're doing it now on a very, very localized level. And we're thinking not about the whole overall structure, but we're thinking about making individual elements work uh, through pneumatic principles. Um, Air inflated structures, uh, here are a couple where you can see that we basically have individual uh, pneumatic elements. They call them balloons here. I think pillows is a little bit maybe more, um, more evocative. We might put an environmental cover over those. We might have separate um, uh, components that enclose our, our structure. Note too that we are always going to have this mechanical system. Now though, note that that compressor is inflating a bladder around the base that in turn feeds into each one of those uh, little balloons or pillows. So we have to worry now uh, about the individual pressure in each one of those elements instead of just the, the overall pressure. We can have a simple door or we actually don't even need an enclosure as you can see here. Um, here is a, a pillow structure that is entirely self-contained. Uh, we can walk under it uh, and not have to worry about affecting the, the pneumatic pressure within the arches and the beams themselves. Um, if one of these pillows uh, is compromised, if it, uh, if it pops or if a seam goes, we only lose that one arch. So it's relatively easy to come back uh, and repair a, a single piece. The structure will probably keep its integrity. We have a little bit better resistance to asymmetrical loading. Each one of these structures again, can resist a little bit of bending, can resist a little bit of compression because of that uh, overpressure on the inside. And because we're trapping air basically within it, we get a little bit better insulation value, but still nowhere near uh, as good as a, as a solid material. Um, load carrying capacity is a little better, although we would probably never use these for multi-story structures. And like uh, the, the simple balloon structures, we have an unobstructed uh, open space. In this case, no need for pressurizing the functional space uh, itself. Um, we have the same disadvantage uh, as the balloon structures in that we have to keep a compressor running all the time and we need to make sure that our power supply is reliable or redundant. Um, this will be a, a more expensive way to build a pneumatic because we have so many uh, smaller components and it'll take a, a longer time to both fabricate uh, and to set up. We're also slightly more limited in the spans that we can get out of these, since these are all going to emulate either uh, an arch or a, or, or a beam. Um, we do end up with some limitations to the span that we don't end up with with the pure uh, balloon structures.
But as you can see, we can get much more creative with shapes. We're limited to the circular geometry, but if we make that circular geometry around, say, an arch or a beam, um, what we do with that arch or beam can be, uh, have a lot more variety to it. Right? We can bend them around more interesting shapes. So here you can see that all of these elements have some circular section to them that reflects the fact that they are pneumatics. Um, but in this case, especially, we have basically uh, a series of arches, circular in section, but parabolic uh, in elevation that allow us much greater freedom uh, in, in form. Um, also at Expo 70, uh, this was a, a World's Fair that uh, had a number of pneumatic structures. This was kind of a big thing in the 60s. And so in 1970, this is what um, this was kind of the structural idea of the future. Um, here, a pavilion by the Fuji company that uh, used these air inflated pillows to wrap a circular ground plan uh, exhibition space. And you can see here the air inflated arches are kind of um, long kind of pool noodle shapes. Uh, these get inflated, they get bent around. So the, um, this uh, arch here goes from here to here. That arch that you can see there goes all the way across. And you can see that as you take um, uh, noodles basically that have the same length and wrap them around a different curvature, you get this kind of saddle shape uh, in, in the other direction. And so if you want to look at it kind of overall, you've got a double curvature, right? You have a positive curvature uh, across it and negative curvature along it. So even though each one of these can operate basically as, a, as an arch, an inflated arch by itself, the fact that they're tied together gives the structure a little bit more integrity, right? Because it has this double curvature to it that's so important for uh, surface structures. Here, a more contemporary example, and, and one that's maybe a little bit more applicable to uh, to things we might encounter today. Um, the uh, air cell uh, is a is a product that uh, makes uh, temporary shelters. So here, a, a sort of temporary hangar for a military jet, you can see each one of the little pillows uh, joined together. And here, uh, an inflatable structure for another inflatable structure, uh, a hangar for the Goodyear blimp, that you can see literally gets brought out uh, in a couple of trucks, spread out by uh, a crew of handlers uh, and then the uh, air is pumped not into the volume itself, uh, but into the membrane skin, right? So that you get these big uh, inflatable arches that go up and over uh, the, the huge dimensions that you need for, uh, for a blimp hanger. Um, so what happens when these go wrong? Well, um, if you have one of these single membrane balloon structures, uh, like for instance, the old Metrodome in Minneapolis, um, a number of things can happen that can, in fact, collapse the structure. And in Minneapolis, uh, notoriously, the Metro Dome collapsed several times uh, when they had uh, asymmetrical snow loading. So more snow gathering in one part of the roof than they had anticipated. Um, and as you can see here, if you let the, um, if, if somehow you let the, the dome deflate at all, let it lose any of its uh, shape, what you end up with is curvature in the, in the wrong direction, right? Negative curvature when uh, snow melts, becomes water, that water has nowhere to go, and eventually you get pooling, ponding, localized stresses that in this case exceeded the capacity of the fabric uh, and collapsed the structure. And you can see here is where the failure took place, but you can also see that right here, there is a lot of snow that is piled up and, and has absolutely nowhere to go. Um, is that a disaster? Well, no one's killed, no one's hurt when these things go down like this. They give plenty of warning. Um, but of course, it's a time and effort and money uh, to come back and repair those uh, and to, and to reinflate them. Um, one final uh, note, and that is that you occasionally see pneumatics being used for formwork. Um, in this case, this is a church uh, in Ames, Iowa, uh, that was built using basically a, a, a giant inflatable structure as formwork. Um, when the, the pneumatic was inflated, um, crews came in and sort of uh, trelled concrete uh, all around it. Uh, when the uh, 
concrete had cured, the pneumatic is kind of deflated and you're left with a, a, a shell structure. Um, interestingly, a shell structure that's not a perfect shape, right? That, that, um, that, that shell wants to have a catenary shape because now it's a compressive structure and the dead load is, is going to govern. The pneumatic, of course, gives you this kind of circular uh, curvature um, that's not quite ideal. This structure is still alive and running though. So even though it's not ideal, uh, it's a robust enough idea uh, that, that, that it actually uh, works. All right, um, we'll leave it there. Um, that is the last uh, lecture for 346. Um, when we come back in the fall, we will talk more about individual structural elements. So slabs, beams, columns, uh, and foundations. Uh, and we'll get into detail about how we detail, uh, or about how we design, sorry, uh, each, each one of those elements.